Thank you everyone for coming. Um, a very warm welcome to everyone who could make it tonight. And I do apologize for all of those people that didn't make it. Um, to watch this award-winning winning film, I, Daniel Blake. My name is Faisi Ismail. I teach in development studies here at SOAS. Uh, we've held a number of uh, events um, in the department, uh, but I think this one stands out as one of the most special. Um, we're absolutely delighted that Ken Loach and Francesca Martinez will be joining us after the screening. Um, like so many of Ken Loach's films, uh, this is not just a powerful drama but I think it's a political intervention um, and one that is sorely needed in Britain today. And I think it's both affecting and effective. Perhaps more than um, any other of his films since Cathy Come Home, I, Daniel Blake, has caught and expressed the popular mood and crystallized a sense of outrage. It's a call to arms and puts the lie to the tired idea that political commitment in some way cheapens storytelling. And it openly takes sides, which again, I think is more needed than ever. We're also very pleased uh, that the People's Assembly Against Austerity could co-host this, this event with us, and I think it's appropriate that they're here. It's campaigns like the People's Assembly, the broadest coalition of trade unions, political parties, campaigns, and concerned individuals around that are crucial to the kind of debates and the kind of mobilizing that we need today. I will hand you over to Steve Sweeney from the People's Assembly. We'll then start the film, uh, and finally, we'll welcome our guests. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Well, <clears throat> thank, thank you very much. Um, I, yeah, my name's Steve Sweeney. I'm one of the uh, National Committee members for the People's Assembly Against Austerity. And for those of you that don't know the organisation, we were founded back in uh, 2013 in response to um, the government's drive, uh, the austerity, uh, all in it together, they kept, they kept telling us, but the government's austerity drive. And we, went, we needed a, a response to that. And um, as Faisy said, we're not a party political organisation in that we don't support any one particular political party, although we do have political parties and support from um, some members of the Labour Party, affiliations from the Green Party, but we're an umbrella organisation and we uh, draw together the broadest um, groups in society from trade unions, uh, including Unite, uh, Unison and the Communication Workers Union that represent workers that are actually um, on the front line of the austerity, austerity cuts. They're finding their terms and conditions are being uh, driven down and the services that they work for are needed are needing to be defended against uh, Tory cuts. We've got the major social movement campaign groups and co progressive organisations involved from Stop the War and War on Want. We have faith groups uh, supporting the People's Assembly. And essentially, that's what we're about. We're, we're fighting uh, against austerity. And although we're a, a national organisation, we also have many local groups, uh, local groups that are involved in campaigning against... Um, uh, attacks on the NHS, library closures, bedroom tax, strike action, many, many other campaigns that are happening in their community. So it's a real grassroots uh, community-based campaign as well. Um, I'm very honoured and pleased to be able to introduce the film tonight. The first time I introduced it was um, at a special advanced screening at the Tory party conference in Birmingham. And there we were. <laughs> There we were, and as we walked to the cinema, we walked past where the Tories were holding their conference, and they had big, ba uh, big barricades, big walls blockading, security and police uh, heavily guarding them. And you sort of think, well, if you're going to do that, you know, do, is there a point they wonder they might realise, actually, we might be the bad guys here? But we took... We took 20,000 people, at least 20,000, maybe more, out on the streets then to oppose their destructive policies. And it's their policies that are seeing the destruction of our National Health Service. It's their policies that are seeing the destruction of our welfare state. It's their policies that are seeing the destruction of housing, um, terms and conditions, jobs uh, being driven down and services being cut and closed. And these are the, all the very things that make up the fabric of society uh, and the very things that, uh, that ordinary people that working class people have fought for being destroyed in the name of austerity. Um, I mean, it's a very moving film, I, Daniel Blake. Uh, it's, a, it's a stark and shocking portrayal of what life is like for many people, uh, of so many people in Tory, in Tory Britain. And as Faisy uh, made reference to, I think it should have 
the same social impact that happened with one of Ken Loach's very first films, Kathy Come Home, which had such an impact um, in terms of the debate and the discussion around, uh, around housing. Um, but the People's Assembly, I'm just going to sort of finish because I know people want to watch the film. Um, but we, I said we're not just about demonstrations, but we are also about demonstrations. And we've got two very important demonstrations coming up, uh, to, or two important events. One, on the 18th of February, um, we're holding a, or co-hosting with a number of, a wide range of organisations, including uh, Muslim Association of Britain, Muslim Council of Britain, um, Stop the War, Stand Up to Races, and many, many other organisations. Um, um, a Stand Up to Trump National Organising Summit, and that's at Friends Meeting House from 10.30am. Uh, I don't need to explain to many people why we're doing that. Uh, I, I guess most of, you, most of you will know, but we need to um, step up the campaign, um, especially as today we've, uh, the, the uh, Chief of Metropolitan Police let slip that Trump will be coming in June. Um, and the other thing that I made reference to again was the National Health Service. It's coming under massive attack from the Tories. Uh, the very foundations of the NHS are threatened in a way like that they've never been uh, threatened since its inception. £22 billion worth of cuts and a massive reorganisation programme which is seeing whole swathes um, of NHS services including accident and emergency services and whole hospitals being closed down. So a group of organisations have come together and on the 4th of March, there's going to be the biggest, hopefully the biggest, but a major national health um, service demonstration. Our NHS, it's organised jointly by the People's Assembly and Health Campaigns Together and has, again, broad support from across, across the movement. So I hope you can support both of those events. Please do get involved in, uh, in the People's Assembly because together we're stronger and we need the broadest movement possible to fight, uh, fight the Tories and fight against austerity. But we know that with broad movements um, and... and uh, and organising within our communities, uh, we can win. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope you enjoy the film. Ken is one of the great cultural figures of contemporary Britain. He's an incredibly prolific filmmaker. His films have always been controversial because they've always challenged the inequalities and the injustice of the miseries of modern Britain. His socially critical directing style and his socialist ideals are evident in the film treatment of social issues in general, poverty, homelessness, uh, and labor rights, amongst others. For many years, the establishment uh, has tried to keep him down, but he's irrepressible. He keeps bouncing back, and he's here tonight. <laughs> Wow, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I've got to pretend that I'm not a huge fan. Why <laughs> that normally? Um, well, as you as you've seen, that film was just incredible. And I, the reason I couldn't watch it before this chat is I knew I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to be in a state to formulate sentences properly. Um, <laughs> The film is just so incredibly powerful and it's almost hard to watch at times. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, what was your inspiration behind this film? And like, what made you pick the subject? And also, did you do a lot of research? Um, well, um, first of all, th 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 thanks for asking me to come and, and, and thanks for coming, everybody. Um, it, it's um, it's rather overwhelming to be here, really. So th thanks a lot for that. Um, Paul Laverty, the writer, and I, um, he lived in Scotland and, and I live in down here. And we exchanged messages every day um, about this and that and what's going on in the world. And, and we found we were increasingly sending each other stories of, um, of about sanctions, about mm -hmm. food banks, about how people were um, really being treated in the most cruel way um, when, when really they just needed help. Um, yeah. and, and how the whole um, idea of the welfare state had been turned on its head. So instead of support, there was punishment. Mm -hmm. And how it was reverting to the old poor law. 
mm-hmm. uh, where, you, where people were set up to fail so that they were an example to others that this is what is in store if you don't do as we tell you. Mm-hmm. So, so that transformation um, just seemed more and more um, significant. So we went on a, a little trip. We went to, first of all, we went to my hometown of Nuneaton in the Midlands, which is an industrial town. Um, and uh, the first day we went, the first, within an hour, we met a 19-year-old lad who was not getting any benefits other than housing benefit. Mm. And he was in a room provided by a charity, which was paid for by his housing benefit. And, and he existed on um, casual work, a bit of work through an agency, a bit in the black economy. He just got by. And he, um, he was in a room that had a, a mattress on the floor in one corner and a fridge in the other corner, and that was it. And Paul said to him, he said, can we be really cheeky and see what's in your fridge? And the lad said, yeah. And he opened the door, and there was nothing in the fridge. There was nothing. It's not a thing. Um, Paul said, do you ever go hungry? Uh, and he said, yes. He said the previous week... He hadn't eaten for three days. And I thought, this, this is incredible. The, the, mm. This is a story that is happening mm. to tens of hundreds of thousands of people. So anyway, so we, we, did, we then obviously went into in, in, in depth. And the big issue was, as you can imagine, that you're confronted by a mass of bureauc- bureaucracy, a mass of regulations, of of documents of, and, and hundreds of stories. Um, and and uh, obviously the, some people s- suffer more than others. And, but it was wherever we went. We went to London, we went to the Midlands, we went to Stoke, we went to Nottingham, we went to the Northwest, we went to Bolton, we went to the Northeast, which is where we eventually did it, we went to Glasgow. And everywhere was the same story. Um, mm. And so Paul wrote a character and then he wrote another character and... Off we went. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think, I think your films really <laughs> explore lives that are quite rarely seen uh, in mm. cinema. And I, for mm. one, was so pleased to see this story being told. Mm. Um, so many of my friends are going through what Dad Blake's going through. They're having their mm. lives mm. completely destroyed. And, you mm. know... Um, Currently, a lot of my friends and myself included with uh, lifelong conditions are now being reassessed. Yeah, um, yeah. We used to be given lifetime awards because that, would, that was considered scientific. Uh, but now the government have decided that we all need to be reassessed. Um, mm-hmm. So they are, they're wasting millions of pounds, you know, because mm-hmm. they send someone around my house every, every few years to say, are you still wobbly? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, how about I give you a wet shave and we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's awful. But, <laughs> um, so I'm so grateful that there are directors and people mm. like you who are using the, you know, art form of film to cover these stories. And I'm really interested in what politicised you in your life. Like, was there an event or a moment that made you feel like you wanted to use art as a force for social change? Or was it a process? Or um, was it a burning desire from, from a young age? Um, it was a process, really. Um, I mean, I um, so we went to school in the 40s and early 50s, uh, which was a very quiet time, um, from this little industrial town in the Midlands. Um, managed to get to a university. And um, it was only there that I... I was aware of class because it was one of the posh ones, and it was um, there were there were there were young men there. And there were young men. There were young men there who had inherited the world, mm. and they had sports cars that I've never seen before. And they they had they talk about it now as a sense of entitlement, uh, but they had a sense of entitlement. Yeah. They went had been to the right schools. 
They were the sons of uh, empire builders and um, they were going to inherit the world and they, they behaved as they would. Mm. And they did, they have. And it was the Bullingdon Club and all the obnoxious people who take part in it. And uh, I was suddenly aware of this, of this level of society, um, which I'd never encountered before. I mean, Nuneaton, there's, there's barely a lower middle class, never mind anything else. And um, so it was, it was very exotic. And then um, I joined the BBC um, in the early 60s and worked with writers. And that was a significant thing. I worked with um, wonderful writers, one in particular, a man called Jim Allen, who was a great socialist writer, working Irish background, um, worked in Manchester, was, lived in Manchester. He, um, he, he was one of that dying breed. Well, he was dying then, I think. He's probably not so, not so common now. Of, of people who would go to work, in, find work, in order to found a, a union branch. Wow. So he, he, was, he was a building worker, he was a dock worker, he was a miner, he started a newspaper in the mines, he'd, he'd, he'd go to a building site, he'd get people organised and then he'd be chased off by the foreman, you know, and great guy, very funny man. Um, and he wrote, I did a lot of films with him and, um, uh, and, and I t learned a lot from him. I mean, he was, he was a, one of these working class men who who was completely self-taught. I mean, he, in his room, he would, had one, word, one wall full of books, and unlike me, he'd read them all, <laughs> and, and was, was, was terrific. Um, and um, he, he always suspected me of bourgeois tendencies, so he would, uh, <laughs> if, if he, in order to re-establish his proletarian credentials, he'd, he'd take his teeth out if he was having a disagreement and put them on the table <laughs> <laughs> and challenge me to do likewise. <laughs> Um, but no, what wonderful man, Jim Allen. And, um, but there's Barry Hines um, and Paul Laverty for the last 20 odd years. And, and, um, but it was th those early, that early writing, which again, the 60s were very political. Yeah. And we were all, um, when joined the Labour Party to, to uh, support Harold Wilson in 63, I think I joined, and 64 was the election. Um, and it took us a couple of years to see through Harold Wilson. And to see that actually it wasn't about changing society at all. Uh, and um, so then there were, it was the time of the anti-Stalinist left that came to prominence and which there were, of course, there were many different groups. And uh, most of us joined one group or another or were sympathetic. And, and in that was very interesting because it was rigorous politically. Mm. And every week you'd be given a, a text read it by Friday, we're going to discuss it, and woe beside you if you hadn't read it. And so for a few years, I mean, every week I read something, and, and it, it was a political grounding that actually is a, a phrase Jim Allen used to use. He'd say, you need political theory as a map and a compass. If you haven't got that, mm -hmm. you don't know the course yeah. you need to steer. And I think that, that was very true. Have you ever found your politics have made films harder for you, like obtaining funding? Um, have, you, have you come up against obstacles? Um, a, a lot in for the first 30 years or so, yes. Um, the last 20 have been quite lucky, um, um, which, um, because we've had European partners most of that time, right. 25 years actually, we've been very lucky because we got French co-producers, Belgians, other countries. And what's great about them is, is that they, they tend to respect films in the way they don't hear. So if you've got a, um, like a British uh, co-producer, they'll, they'll maybe have comments about the script that you don't want to hear. Um, so they say, what about this, that, and the other? And we say, well, no, the French like that particularly. Yeah. So, you do. <laughs> so in a way that, that um, puts the criticism out of court. Um, <laughs> But the, no, the, the decade, the, the worst decade was the 80s. Right. Um, because uh, I tried to do documentaries then in the middle of the Thatcher onslaught. Right. And they got, they got banned. Wow. Um, That's a compliment, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes, they were well banned. Done. <laughs> I think I got all together, we got, we got um, 
four films banned altogether, two wow. films um, taken out of the schedules and delayed until they were useless. Um, I got a theatre production banned. Um, everything I couldn't I couldn't direct traffic in the eighties. Um, well, you were so, the uni here, yeah. and I think we all just think you're really cool for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't want to hug you all to myself, but I want to say, um, if anyone's got any con contributions or questions or comments, um, we can, like, have you throughout the uh, evening. I don't, don't just want to chat and then squeeze you at the end, like, not important. So do people want to put their hand up? I feel like a teacher. <laughs> um, um, hello, yes, and the guy here, um, this is like question time, <laughs> <laughs> but left wing. <laughs> There's a girl towards the back. Isn't yes, there? great, yeah. OK, I will take a girl at the back okay. after. I'm, uh, I'm Mark Robinson, I work here at CISD, a fantastic movie, Ken. I'm a, a lifelong, lifelong fan, um, and you might tell from the accent I'm from the area where you set the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things in your movies, all of them, that is remarkable, are the cast. Mm -hmm. And I think that's yeah. really true in this movie. Um, I'm the same age as Dave Jones, um, and I'm from South Shields. One of the themes that always comes across, I believe, is there but for the grace of God go yeah. I. Mm -hmm. And I think when you've got a job and you've got a little bit of family and support, people can think that that couldn't happen to them or it doesn't apply to them. So my question and point really is, you know, I think it applies to everybody because yeah. it really could happen to somebody out the blue. And whether you share that uh, thought. Absolutely. I, I, think that's, I think that was one of the points we wanted to make. We wanted to find characters who were not obvious losers, you know, because the, 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 um, the stereotype is, oh, well, you know, they're lazy, they're feckless. Um, it's a woman with too many children. It's, um, it's, a, it's someone who's addicted, you know, and so he's, what do you expect? And so we wanted to, 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 to find characters, uh, n not, not to say that, of course, everyone needs to be treated with dignity and respect and, and helped, of course, whatever their circumstances. But we didn't want to give the right wing an easy, uh, an, an easy put down. So the characters... Um, it, it like, as you say, almost everybody is a few paychecks away from disaster. Um, and, uh, and he's at the older end of the labor market, so it's not going to be easy to find a job. He's, got a, he's a fine craftsman, but it's not a, a craft that is particularly valued now. Um, and absolutely could be anybody. Um, and... Uh, and it, it is anybody. I mean, we, we met, when we were doing the research, we met a little woman in a Glasgow food bank who was as neat and precise as you could wish. You know, you saw walking down the street, you think, wow, she's really, you know, a woman of some dignity and presence and really takes care of herself. Um, she came into the food bank and almost wanted to leave because she was so ashamed to be there. Um, and uh, her story was she'd been, um, she again had become ill. She was in her early 60s. She'd worked all her life. She was, um, she'd worked in the supermarkets at the checkout. She'd done, you know, that kind of work, but a very, a very, um, somebody who was very comfortable with herself. I mean, she wasn't, she was a lovely woman. And, and, and she'd had an illness. She'd fallen down. They, she hadn't been, they, they'd given her the sack because actually they wanted somebody younger. Um, she'd, um, she'd had her family, she'd supported her younger children, so she hadn't got any money left herself. Um, she, could, she was probably going to have to move out of her house, so all her money was going into rent. And she, she was starving. And this woman was 62, had worked all her life. You know. Another man came to the door at the same time, and, and he, he came in and and was de obviously deeply in shock at finding himself where he was and just went away. And they tried to catch him and said, come on back, you know, we can help you. Mm. And, and he was, oh God, it's always one. <laughs> Why is it me? <laughs> That's terrible. You see, if I hadn't had a mic on, you wouldn't have heard it. Um, <laughs> That's um, how popular you are. I know, no. I'm so, it's, really, it's really um, embarrassing. Talk, talk with There was a talk. woman <laughs> up at the back um, with her hand up. Yes, um, 
Do you have something you'd like to say? Yeah, there's a mic on the way. Hi, my name's Marcel. I um, run a, an organisation called Chatterbox, which provides uh, conversation practice classes for language students at SOAS. Some of you may know about already. Um, I'm going to echo what the gentleman said, just an astoundingly beautiful portrayal of reality and so moving. Um, my question is, um, it was sort of inspired when you mentioned that you come from Nuneaton, um, and I know that town particularly well because one of my university housemates was from that area, and I would, looked with horror as it turned blue two elections ago. Do you know why that is? Why did that happen in towns like Nuneaton? Um, I, I think this is a very, I mean, this is a very important question, really. Um, and I think it's, I, I, I think it's um, alienation, despair, feeling no one cares about, about you, feeling your voice isn't heard, um, and feeling that the Labour Party of that for decades has really looked the other way, um, has let industries have died and there's been no replacement. Um, and it's, um, I think it's, it's, it's typical of many places in, in, the, in the depressed areas. Um, maybe that's the west, well, it's the middle of the Midlands. Um, it's true in the West Midlands, true in, we all know the places where, where it's our equivalent of the Rust Belt. Um, and I think, I think in all the discussions about that, I don't think we're really understanding it. To me, and I don't know if people here agree, to me it goes back to, it at least goes back to the uh, Thatcher-Reagan um, counter-revolution really where not counter-revolution but the big shift to the neoliberal politics where they said uh, capitalism has got to go full steam ahead without regulation wherever however it has to make money that's what we should allow yes. um, so the investments can be taken from this place and put where the labor is cheap um, we need to make laws against trade unions so people have no defense um, and capitalism has to rip uh, there was a whole school of economists, wasn't there, the Chicago school. They tested it out in, in Latin America and different countries there. Yeah. Um, and that's what they pursued ruthlessly. Yeah. They allowed unemployment to go through the roof from half a million or less, below half to three million, within a year. So suddenly there was chaos, suddenly everything collapsed. And we've lived with that at different levels ever since. Yeah. Um, and that, that's, that's the root of it. And at the same time, the Labour Party went um, from Blair through, well, accommodated to Thatcher. Yeah. Neil Kinnock played a dishonourable role in kicking the, getting rid of yeah. the left in the Labour Party and going along with the broad principles of Thatcherism. And uh, Blair, of course, was the ultimate example. And Brown followed suit. And people thought, well, they're all the same. They're all the same. So when... When someone comes along and says, do you know what, it's not your fault, it's the person next yeah. to you. They're to blame. They've taken your job. Yeah. They look different. They've got a different language. And it's the old siren call, simplistic answers mm. to a complex problem. Yeah. And of course, the, I mean, the left has, I think, is now beginning to get the right answers under Jeremy Corbyn, but it's... It's a long struggle. But I think that, that's where it goes back to, to my mind. And, um, and you meet, I mean, I meet people there um, and, and they're just angry and they don't know quite why they're angry, but they just feel a sense of disillusion. I wanted to just ask you about authority in general because mm -hmm. I've done a lot of work with the People's Assembly Against mm -hmm. Authority, who mm -hmm. are not the primary voice in this country mm -hmm. against authority. They do great work. <laughs> But I've really come to believe that austerity is then about saving money. Um, I think it has a much more sinister edge. And I think it's really about trying to create a culture where there is no compassion or social responsibility or support network, basically America. Um, <laughs> And I think it uses the um, divisive uh, politics of fear and hate to sow seeds among us of division. 
so that we blame each other, we turn against each other. And I really believe it's part of this wider shift to create a society where the state has no role. And I, I believe that politics is, is ideas, basically, and the world is shaped um, by ideas. And I think we have to fight these rotten ideas. And I just wondered um, what your thoughts were on, on the agenda behind austerity and what you, how, how can we fight that disgusting value system and reclaim a society where our governments are proud to invest in people, in health, in education. I, 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 yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, amen to all that. I, I, I think, um, and, and you're right, it, it's based on an ideology and, and the, the, the ideological base, I think, is that... Um, that uh, capitalism is progressive and that in order for it to develop it must it must penetrate every aspect of our lives so that what we saw as a public service is not is not to be funded by us it's it's to be it, it's best um, it's best organized by private companies that we have a yeah. personal relationship with so you take out a private insurance company and they uh, they provide private health care and yeah. um, and, and that's the way it should be. Yeah. I mean, it's also the, the, the demand of capital itself to, to, to expand. It can never find equilibrium. Mm. I mean, I'm sure there are better scholars here than, than I am, but that's, that's, as I understand it, that they have to expand. They, mm. they, they never reach a point at which we say, OK, we're, na we're making enough money, um, our markets are secure, We'll just keep doing what we're yeah. doing. They can't do that. No. They have to expand. They have to take over another company. They have to find another market. They have to cut their labour costs. They have to attack the raw materials so that they're cheaper. So to maintain their market yeah. share. So in order to maintain their market share, they're constantly having to attack the working class. Yeah. They're constantly having to have an aggressive foreign policy, to have a sphere of influence in which their products will... will, will um, Will, will be sold. Yes. So they're, they're constantly on the attack. And, and that means that um, they're constantly expanding. And if they're, if they're producing everything that can be produced, they've got to get into the services. Yes. So they've got the railways now, and so they've got to, um, they've got to get into now health. Mm. You know, and the area, I mean, I live in the southwest now, they've just voted to allow Richard Branson yeah. to look after social care yeah. and some aspects of social care. Richard Branson, he needs another island, obviously, in the Caribbean. I mean, what a disgrace that we cannot, between ourselves, look after each other, except we've got to, someone has to make a profit. Well, I, so that, I, that's the, yeah. I think that's the ideological base. And yes. sorry, just one thing to add to that. So therefore, to stop people challenging that, they have to say, if you're poor, Mm. It's your fault. Yes. If you haven't got a job, you are to blame. You haven't filled in your CV right. right. Yes. You haven't, um, uh, you've been five minutes late for an appointment. You've, um, you're inadequate. You're not competent. In order to demonstrate that, we now have to punish you. Mm. And because we know when sanctions happen, as you were saying, people's lives are in chaos. Mm. Absolutely in chaos. And they can't eat. Yeah. So hunger is the weapon. And you have, to, you have to ask them. I've been waiting for a chance to ask this. I've, they never, I've never managed to get up against one of them yet. You have to ask them, what is the crime for which hunger is the punishment? Because they know what yeah. they're doing. They know what they're doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah totally. Um, mm. As a wobbly woman, I really think that sickness and disability presents a really big problem for capitalism. Because they require compassion and imagination and empathy. And I think in a system which tries to um, view human beings as economic co commodities and like cogs in a machine, well, those who are different and have different bodies and different health issues, um, some of them can't be cogs in a machine. So I kind of think um, disability and sickness uh, really is like um, 
well, in a way, a spanner in the works. I mm -hmm. don't think this system knows what to do because it, if it admits that we should be caring and compassionate to people with health and it needs, then we should be caring and compassionate to everybody. Mm. So I think the system really does not know how to handle um, health yeah. issues in yeah. any meaningful way. Yeah. I, I, but you see, that's why they like charities. Yes. They love charities. <laughs> The Queen is patron of them, or, you know, or you the sure? royal family. I mean, they love it. They love they it. Do love and it. they get knighthood for it, and they get, <laughs> they get peerages. And they're like, it's the old image of the Lady of the Manor going round on Christmas morning with sweets round the cottages for the tied workers. That's, that's their image. That's how they solve all these issues. Nothing to do with what we can do collectively. It's charity. And that's why... That's why charities are so, I was going to say dangerous, because they make acceptable what is unacceptable, and, and they're a cover. Yeah. And of course, when you're faced with people who are in desperate need, of course, everyone is going to contribute, and of course, you can't walk by. And of course, you know, we do charity, you do charity gigs, I'm sure, and we do, and, yeah. you know, put on a screening, whatever, and, and raise money. And of course, you can't walk by, but that's what they love. You know, that's their answer. It's, it's a pass the hat round society is they, what they want. Um, are there any... Oh, yes, OK. <laughs> yes. Um, I think the, the lady down here who's had her hand up the well, and then we'll go up here. Mr. Loach, thank you very much for that powerful film that you've made um, and the true story that it tells about our society. Uh, speaking of compassion and also power, I think one of the, in my opinion, one of the powerful sort of underlying yet subtle, I think, messages that I pick up from your film is how individualistic our society is and how mm. the community has mm. been completely abolished yeah. in a greater system where the state becomes our main and only core authority for our social relations and um, money, basically. So yeah. I don't know if that was one of the sort of deeper messages that you were trying to get at, but I'd love your comments on how the concept of family and the concept of community was missing in the story of these characters. Mm. Well, it, it's interesting that because in a way it seemed to us, it seemed to us that, that in a way there were two, there were two conflicting images of, of community. Uh, the, there were the, the people who ran the food bank and um, you know, the, his neighbours um, and um, who in a way were, and the people at work and his work community was, you know, was very, it was just, you know, the guys at work really and, and the crack and the jokes and the, the thing between them that is very sustaining. Um, the, the, his neighbours and the people at the food bank and, and they were wonderful and they, that, that's the actual women who ran that food bank and, and two or three men and brilliant and, and what there was one thing that just epitomised their kindness to me is that when you, I mean you may may well volunteer some of you and, and take part but, but what touched me touched all of us was when the woman said when she asked her to, to go around with this, she didn't say, come and let me give you some food. She said, let me help you with your shopping. And such a, such a little thing, but what, 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 you know, what, what a lot it means in, in preserving someone's dignity. Of course, yeah. Brilliant. And the state, yeah. which in, in an ideal world would represent the best of us, would represent that, of course, is its absolute reverse, yeah. you know. So you you got those two images like conflicting. Yeah. And there was a lady up there. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm I'm Claire from Invisible Women with Visible and Invisible Disabilities. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Ken for coming to the vigil for Lawrence Bond in in. Uh, Camden outside Kentish Town Job Centre on the 25th of January. Mm -hmm. It was Lawrence Bond's funeral today. Mm -hmm. And he was a, a local man who 
um, collapsed and died of a suspected heart attack on leaving Kentish Town Job Centre and he had been cut off ESA for around six months and had, had been refused at mandatory reconsideration and was waiting for his appeal. And um, so that there's more information about, about, about the campaign for him on the Invisible Facebook page and there's a lot of organisations, Camden Momentum and others, um, Kilburn Unemployed Workers Group involved. And at that, at that vigil, we also remembered Lillian Olluk and her two-year-old daughter, Lynn, who had starved to death in Kent. And they were not claimants in the benefit system. They were seeking asylum. And the asylum seekers were the first to be made destitute um, under labour. And um, so we remembered them... And that's now the standard for everybody. And John McDonnell, who also came to the vigil, he was opposed to the work capability assessment from 2006 when it was a Labour bill yeah. and when there was a, a disability demonstration at the Manchester Labour Conference where we were inside the Ring of Steel and he was the only MP to come and speak to us. <laughs> and of course now is joined by... Jeremy Corbyn, who's supported a lot of the demos. And I think it's really important for us to keep in touch because there's another, there's another cut coming, which is the cut to ESA, driving people in the work-related activity group down to job seekers level and um, a loss of £30. And also, with the work-related activity group, there's people who've died from being cut off but there's also thousands of people who've died from the compulsory back-to-work activities, uh, people with cancer, heart conditions, and so on. And just with what Francesca was saying on um, being wobbly, being a challenge to society, um, you know, we've always said that disability, living, coping with disability is very hard work. And um, whether or not we do wage work on top, we're already working. There are so many hands. Okay, over here. Thank you for that film. I watched it a few months ago. Uh, I was very moved by it. Um, I was in tears at uh, key particular scenes. Um, I would like to say um, you are a master of cinema. I'm, I love cinema. I'm studying it at Ravensbourne, and you came and spoke um, before I arrived. Uh, at the college, so you you make really powerful films. That film is it really. I, I I see a lot of people crying. I was in tears the first time. I was almost in tears the second time. Really empower, powerful, emotive film. A big brick at the Tories. Um, I was going to ask. Um, I was going to ask a question, but maybe I'll throw it out later. Um, what's a good way of being uh, a better writer? And can I push that question aside? Um, <clears throat> a better writer for cinema and telling powerful stories at the same time I'm not an academic, I'm a filmmaker um, I want to tell stories I realise uh, the quote left is currently losing the argument in terms of the popular mass society or even the mainstream we need, to, I agree with you a thousand percent, I've watched Adam Curtis documentary since, for the last five years um, I've I mean, I th I think um, we need to we need to tell a new story and include the best parts of what we have and reach for something better, uh, a better new alternative to what is going on now. We do have Trump reaching for old ideas. He's reaching in his back pocket for some old nineteen. 30s or, or even some corporate authoritarianism, which I think you've said in interviews, that's, uh, I really don't like that. I am, I, I, I'm neither left or right, I must say. I'm, I'm for the progressive of humans uh, altogether. I want to avert any form of uh, violence being enacted on people. 
Um, and that's, I guess that's what the point of society is. I, I was thinking of the meaning of life. Anyway, uh, what, what new alternative for the future could we ask for or expect or push through? Because remember, when all these... Um, when Martin Luther, not only was he doing... Um, uh, was he against racism, he was also... Uh, put helping uh, the day he died or the week he died, he was helping rubbish workers. Um, he was helping a union. We must push for something better, a better alternative, rather than, and and it can be done with telling stories. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's um, it, it, it's a complicated. Um, series of issues that I think you, you bring up there, really. Um, What's the answer? <laughs> well, I think it's, it's disentangling the, the question a bit. I mean, change, yes. I mean, of course, we all want to see change. How can we deal with the pressing problems that we face? Housing, poverty, work, sustainable work, everyone having a place in society overarching questions like the climate, the, the destruction of the planet. How do we do that? Um, I, I think, I mean, I've got a very traditional answer, really, which is that we have to plan it, plan it, plan the planet. Um, because otherwise, if you leave it to the alternative, which is the free market, yeah. um, it will go. It yes. will, it's on its way. So we have to plan how we use the, world, the, earth, the earth resources. We have to plan how we divide up the work. We have to plan what we produce and so on. You can't plan what you don't own. You know, we can't plan for G4S or whatever it is. We can't plan Virgin. We can't plan, you know, yeah. the big corporations. So they have to become ours. And we have to, and now how do we decide what the plan is? Well, we have to have some sort of democracy. How do we get there? Well, what's the powerful, what's the most powerful force in the world? I still think the working class is. Because nothing moves without it's moved by people who work for a living, or nothing is made, or nothing is sold, or nothing in the shops. So that, that I think, is the traditional answer, but I think that is the powerful force. And it's why, apart from the fact they have the best jokes, apart from the fact they're the nicest people, that's why the working class is important, you know, because they have the power. So I think it's about organizing that, it's, it's about the political um, engagement, and it's enormously complicated and complex and strategic and tactical on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's how we harness that strength. So I th it's an old traditional answer, comrades, but I think that's, that's the only way, really. And, <laughs> and, uh, my second question, um, how, how did you become a better writer? You work with writers, just briefly. Um. Who's talking? Oh. So. He raised the question regarding how to become a better writer. You haven't, you haven't oh, answered that question. How do you become a better writer? Um, I don't know. I'm not a writer. I think that's really important that uh, film directors are not writers. Um, and I respect writers hugely. Mm. The ones that I know best, the best ones, um, are the ones who listen. Listen. Listen how people speak. I mean, first of all, you've got to find a story, a good story. And it seems to me a good story is one where there's an inner conflict, an inner contradiction that you have to tease out and do it truthfully and accurately and with observation. We've got to tease out that story. And when you do it, and it'd be quite small, but if you've got the right story, it has a significance beyond the, that little narrative. So it's, I mean, this is just a little story. Yes. But you hope that it has a significance beyond these two characters. And so I think that's finding the story. And, and listening to people, how they speak, you know, really capture the rhythm of how they speak. Because it's always unexpected, you know. They don't speak like most writers write. No. They just speak differently. So I think listening, enjoy language, you know. The best writers really love language. Mm. So I think it's those two things. I mean, I don't know. There's lots of ways. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, we have 
uh, a question from the front. Really? <laughs> okay, uh, I was saying that, can we on the left, broadly speaking, ever find a solution to the problem that I call the BBC? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In terms of the way they portray or not these uh, issues, and then attack people who address them. Yeah, um, that was one of my questions. <laughs> yeah, how, basically, not, I want to slightly put the addition to that and say, not just a BBC, but how do we tackle the corporate media machine? I know this is a perennial conversation yeah. that we have the left. Like, um, how do we, how do we like uh, counter that level of propaganda? You know, they have all the money of the media outlets, and and they push their narratives. And you know, how do we start to challenge that? And and get a better narrative out there. Um, I, I, it's huge. I mean, God knows, it, it, it's hugely difficult. I, I think um, I, I think there's two or three things to say. I mean, first of all, in the long term, and of course, you can't do this until the Labour under Corbyn, for example, might be in power. Is the left has never had a media policy, mm. and and I think the first of all, you've got to, we've got to start talking about the freedom of the press. Yes. Yeah and separating that from the freedom of big corporations to own it, because obviously they will pursue their own interests. So we, I, I would say that, that um, a newspaper, to own a national newspaper, or to own a newspaper, there has to be, it has to be a cooperative, yeah. and it has to be a cooperative of journalists and print workers, and everybody involved, and maybe with readers. There's got to be, there's got to be a, a cooperative ownership not owned by a corporation, only one, you can only, each corporation could only uh, own one newspaper or TV station or whatever, you only have one. But in the meantime, um, and also you've got to democratise the BBC, because the BBC, I mean, make no mistake, is an arm of government, it's an arm of yes. the state. Yes. It's like the police, it's like the established church, and so on. It, it is an arm of the state, yes. and it's controlled by political appointments. Um, and, and there's a saying there um, that um, is, is what can we get away with? Which is what journalists or writers or programme makers say. You know, what can we get away with? Um, and I think it has to be democratised and power has to be at the, at the bottom. Um, and obviously there's got to be all kinds of reflections of um, elected power and... Um, community power bases and trade unions and workplaces. We've got to devise a system of a, a democratic system. Not easy, but, but it, it, it could be done. But in the short term, now I've turned my phone off, I can give you a number, if I turn it back on, where you can, um, you can phone. And it's, I mean, this is just, just to make you feel better and, um, <laughs> and, to, um, and, and it, they do read the daily log, I know. Now, you can phone this number, and um, you don't, you get, you, you, the first thing you, you get, a, you press option one, which I think is make a comment about the BBC. And then, then you go to another three more choices. And there's um, make, a, uh, make a criticism, uh, say something approving, or then make a complaint. Now, you go to option three. <laughs> And you get you, clearly rang this a lot. Oh yeah, and you, you get put through to a nice person in, in the north of Ireland. I don't know why it's Ireland, but it is. And, um, and they write it down and they put it on the log. Now, just do it from time to time. It, it, <laughs> when, when, when you hear, um, when you hear, you know, like questions based on false assumptions. When you hear one side given and not the other, yes. um, when you hear uh, the left discounted, but when you hear a trade unionist being asked, why are you holding the public to ransom? You know, that's the yeah. usual one. Instead of, what's the justice of your claim? You know, whenever you feel that's crossed the line, give them a ring. Right, hang on. <laughs> I'm not very good at handling this equipment, as you will have noticed, but, oh God, it's searching for network. No. <laughs> I'm done now. I'll, let's talk about something else for a moment. Um, and I'll, well, I'll come back. <laughs> I just wanted to pick up quickly because um, 
We've been to Jerry Corwood a few times. Yes. And you and I have spoken at a few JP for PM events. Because I think we both feel that he's a real political alternative and probably the most progressive Labour leader we've ever had. Um, and I certainly feel that men like Corbyn don't normally get into power. I see it like a, a glitch in the matrix. You know, it happened. But it won't happen again. And so I feel that it's so important that we stay united behind him in support. Um, because... I do think he presents a rare opportunity. And I think if he goes, I think the powers that be will make sure that we don't get another leader like him again. Um, so I really wanted to ask you about the issue of unity because so often the left fragment into different groups and that weakens our chances of success and of winning and particularly the last few weeks we've had Brexit and I know a lot of people have strong emotions and it's a complex issue and I understand all the feelings but my overriding feeling is we've got to stay united because you know what the right are so bloody united they're so good at loyalty and of sticking to the bigger picture. And I think we've got to reclaim those values on the left. I will stop ranting now. <laughs> but um, uh, what's your thought on unity? How can, we, how can we encourage people to focus on what we share, not on what we don't? Big question. Uh, first of all, if you've got pencils, this is the number. Back to the number. <laughs> It's, it's 03700 1 It's worth a shout now and then, because you do feel better for it, I tell you. <laughs> Particularly on the Today programme. Yes. OK. Um, <laughs> good. On, on the important matter, I, I, I think that this is very interesting. Um, and, and the question of unity. I mean, it, it seems to me that, that for, I mean, th this is an absolutely extraordinary opportunity. I think it's the first time, certainly the first time in my lifetime, and I think it's the first time in the whole history of the Labour Party that there's a leader of the party who will stand alongside workers in struggle. He went to the, he stood on the, with the junior doctors on picket lines, yeah. He went to the steel workers in South Wales when they were threatened with closure. He's openly supported the, um, the drivers on Southern Rail. No other Labour leader ever does it. Not Ed Miliband, not any. Never does it. And to actually identify yourself with that struggle, I think, is absolutely extraordinary. He's the first Labour leader as I understand it, who has actually n now wants to circumscribe the uh, capital, the interests of capital, yeah. uh, to actually take, take, reduce their power. Even Clement Attlee, the prime minister that established the welfare state in, in his period, sent troops in against strikers, and the welfare state was in order to facilitate the good function of capital. It was to provide a well-housed, a healthy workforce after the war. Mm. And, and good, you know, dependable energy, uh, dependable utilities, transport that worked. So, but it wasn't to establish socialism. So I think Corbyn is absolutely extraordinary. And of course we know he's only there because the right was so arrogant mm. that they thought, oh well, we'll give a left winger a, like a, a pass yeah. onto the main competition because yeah. nobody will vote for him and um, <laughs> we can also show how, you know, what a broad church we are. And of course, suddenly... <laughs> it backfired. It backfired. Because the people didn't want Blair and Brown and the remnants of that social democratic party. They wanted change. So now the problem is that as far as I know, the left 
even those who are not in the Labour Party, and, and I'm not in the Labour Party yet, but the, the groups are absolutely support Jeremy Corbyn, support the left in the Labour Party. Of course there will be, there will be critical support, there will be people who are saying, well, we'd, we'd prefer this and we'd prefer yeah. that, but that's fine. I mean, that's part of our debate on the left, but there's, everyone would actually support Jeremy on the left and John McDonnell, absolutely. Yeah. But what we're left with is this rump that came into, into politics under... Blair or just before him and voted for the privatisation of the health service, voted, um, uh, wouldn't uh, repeal the trade union laws, um, supported privatisation when Labour privatised uh, the, what's it, the, um, the air traffic control, whatever, supported that privatisation. Most of them voted for the illegal war. Mm. So they are, they are committed to the politics of the labor right, and they have a sense of entitlement. They feel the party is theirs. Mm. So there's a visceral hatred mm. of the left. There's a determination to get the party back, and they will do, st it seems to me, they will stop at nothing to get rid of him. Yeah. There's a, it's very interesting, there's a, in the Evening Standard tonight, if you look on page four, there's a, um, an interview about talking about Corbyn and whether he, win, he can sustain his position. There's a, a quotation from a Labour MP, unnamed of course, because they're such cowards. <laughs> unnamed, he's saying, um, we've stopped attacking, you'll find it, it's on page four of the Evening Standard. We've stopped attacking Jeremy now, so if he fails, it's his own fault. <laughs> Meanwhile, of course, leaking that quote. Yeah. So, of course, they haven't stopped attacking him at all. I mean, there are one or two outriders, like there's the bloke from Bermondsey, who attacked Jeremy Corbyn for supporting our film because he yeah. said, what a waste to tell people with no money they've got to go and spend £10 at the cinema. This is, wow. this is the depths of the Labour Party in Parliament, most of them. They are, well... What an Aaron Bevan said about the Tories, I won't repeat it. I mean, they are, they are determined to destroy him. Yeah. And the only way we can fight back is to create the biggest movement. I mean, yes. they, they treat being Labour MPs as though it's a job for life. I mean, they've got more job security than any of their constituents. So I, 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 think, <laughs> I think we need, to, everyone needs to get into the CLP whichever CLP it is, make certain that if, if, they're, if they're one of the 170 who oppose Jeremy Corbyn, that they are not there at the next election. Yes. That is the only way we can yes. do it. Um, there was a guy up there waving frantically, okay. and okay. I can't ignore him any longer. <laughs> no. Can we get a mic up there, please? Thank you. And, and uh, also, I'm aware that, that uh, we can't go on talking yeah. for too long. Otherwise, we'll be the only people left in the we, cinema. But we will. we'll have one more. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is Lenin. I'm one of the cleaners of this university, one of the precarious workers, and also one of the source workers that is working under our source company that this university contract uh, for many years. Yes. Uh, also, I'm a member of the SOAS, Justice for SOAS Cleaners campaign, yes. which mm -hmm. Ken Launch has been supporting for on day one. For me, it's an honor to be here again, and also an honor to represent my, my colleagues. And I'm here on behalf of them to tell you thank you so much for, for these powerful movies. And also, I would like to mention, in 2006, after watching your movie, Bread and Rose, was when became the inspiration of the campaign. And since then, we have been inspiration now because throughout the campaign, we have achieved the London Living Way, Union Recognition, CPA, Holiday Pay, and after that, or uh, step has been followed by other fellow cleaners. So I just wanted to thank you for uh, to make this inspiring movie to all of us because which reflect the real lives, what's happening not only to migrant workers, it happened to normal people like us. And yes, and also I would like to take the opportunity that on behalf of not only all the SOAS outsourced workers, and also on behalf of all the 
work that has been inspired by your movie and our campaign across London to have an opportunity to have an event with you because that, that's what we want because your movies have been so powerful and also the campaign has been so inspired. At the moment, we're still fighting because this university seems to not to understand what outsource means. Outsource means injustice and exploitation. And we want to finish with the, the uh, outsource it because we don't want to feel any more injustice and exploitation for many years. And thank you so much again. For me, it's a privilege again to watch this movie. And God bless you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Well, what, 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 what can I say? I think that the, the, big, the next big step is to get all the workers in-house so that there's no outsourcing. That, that, that's the big demand. Yeah. Um, can I also encourage all the students here to support justice for cleaners because they're fighting a fight for all of us. Better working conditions, so it's really important to get behind them and to be part of their fight. Mm. Um, I'm aware that time is ticking. Um, mm. I think we might have time for one more question. Um, oh my goodness, this is that? <laughs> oh God, I hate ticking. Um, so I, this woman is bobbing up and down, she wins. Okay, go. <laughs> Uh, because once our lecturer mentioned that you are against cinematic hegemony, so firstly, I want to hear more about this. And then the second question is about your understanding of the independence of filmmaking. Yeah, the independence it. of? Filmmaking. Right. Yeah. What was the first question? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, was it corporate hegemony? Yeah, the, the that cine little chestnut. <laughs> yeah, the cinematic hegemony. Right. Yeah, but it's just one time our tutor once mentioned it. Yeah, and uh, she mentioned that you are against cinematic hegemony, but I haven't yes. like hear more about this, so I'm just curious about this. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically, I'm, is her teacher correct? Yes. Well, well, I think the teacher is. I, I don't usually use those long words, but the, 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 the teacher is dead correct. Um, well, I mean, it's it's another reflection of what we were saying earlier of, of a reflection against the the class struggle, isn't it? Of um, of how do you tackle that that uh, power? Um, and I think we we. we we have to begin where people are. We have to begin with demands for secure work, you know, which again, I think the Labour Party is getting towards with John McDonald's commitment to public investment in, in regions where there is no work. Public investment, and I would hope the public ownership of those, that work, that, uh, those, those industries that are established, and then you start to eat away. And it's about building an organized working class. So that means strong trade unions. Because in the end, we can win. You know? as, um, as Shelley said, they are, we are many, they are few. You know? We can win. It's a question of organizing, of being international, of recognizing. I mean, this is a big, big question of recognizing that workers in other countries are on our side they, because the. Mm. The ruling class set, tries to set, as you were saying earlier, they try to set again, against each other. You know, the migrant is your enemy. Mm. No, no. The migrants are part on our mm. side. They're part of our struggle. And, and together we are exploited by the same people. So yes, it, it's, it's understanding the international nature of the working class and organizing internationally. Trade unions are very good at sloganizing about internationalism. But too often it's about British jobs for British workers, you know. What a, what a terrible slogan that is. It's got to be international. So I think that, you know, it's obviously there's a lot to say and cleverer people than me will say it, but, you know, that, that's how we begin, I think. Um, independent filmmaking, well, it would be a lovely thing, really. <laughs> um, I mean, some, you, you get lucky. When you've been around a long time, you get like a, a pensioner's season ticket where they allow you to continue. But... but um, <laughs> But otherwise, it's a real struggle. And the sad thing is, there are so many brilliant 
young filmmakers. That I meet at many events who, who, who are obviously talented, and you know there are always talented people, mm. talented actors, talented writers, mm. absolutely, who, who, are, who don't get the chance that we got in television, because television is now so formulaic. Mm. You know, yeah. there are now so many people above you in television. There's the story editors, there's the, there's the, uh, the producers, the executive producers, the co-producers, the heads of channel, the heads of this, the head of pencils, the head of everything, the head of... <laughs> and they all, have a, they all have something to say, you know, they all want to know. Well, you know, and they suggest you do this and they suggest you do that. Because if they don't make a suggestion, what's their job? They've got no job. So it's... There is this inverted pyramid telling you how to function, and it squeezes the originality out. Mm. So, so that's something else. When we democratise the BBC, we'll give the money to the programme makers. You know, easy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> lots of things, to, lots of big struggles, but the overriding one, you were right, the overriding one is the tactical thing immediately is to keep the left leadership in the Labour Party, because mm. we have the chance one chance in a lifetime, and that includes your lifetimes probably, one chance in a lifetime to have a mass party led by socialists. Don't let it go. Yeah. Don't let it go. Yeah, Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Before you all rush off, I just want to thank you so much for coming. And I also want to say, on your way out, there'll be a bucket collection for the People's Assembly Against Austerity. They are an amazing organisation. They were a big part in Corbyn's uh, leadership uh, success. They really put anti-austerity on the agenda. But as a word, they, they have no corporate donors, surprise, surprise. So if you could spare any pennies, please give generously. And I just want to say a huge thank you to Kelloat. Um, you are not only a filmmaker and an amazing director, you are someone who inspires love and hope everywhere you go, I'm sure. And I just want to thank you from everyone from all of us uh, I think I'm not alone in saying that it's so important to have art out there that reflects our times and that shows us a better way forward um, so thank you so much for being you and for giving us hope in humanity okay. thank, thank you, you. Thanks, a lot. <laughs> thanks a lot thank you Thank you so much. Thank you so much.